Good morning and welcome to Prime Time. Uh, Prime Time at BU Library is designed to celebrate the experiences and accomplishments of Bethel faculty, <coughs> students, and staff. It's a collaboration uh, project between the Friends of the BU Library, Faculty Development, and other offices on campus. Most of the presentations are recorded and can be found in the BU Digital Library. Be sure to check uh, the library news and events webpage in the BU calendar for what's coming up on the schedule. Did you know that when things get tiny, unfamiliar laws of physics take place? In the world of nano-sized particles, silver can turn your skin blue, sand starts to glow, water becomes thick as honey, and punching through a sheet of nanocarbon requires the pressure of an elephant balanced on a pencil tip. Join us on Thursday, March 31st, when Faculty Excellence Award winner for scholarship, Dr. Nathan Linquist, Assistant Professor of Physics, shares some interesting science that highlights the study of nanotechnology in our own physics department. Today, we welcome Dr. Ripley Smith, Professor of Communication Studies, as he shares a comparative study of virtues from 14 countries, which explores the connections between faith, place, and culture in order to assess the utility of virtues as horizons for intercultural understanding. Okay, let's welcome Dr. Smith. And apologies to you, those of you who thought that today's presentation was actually Nate that was going to be speaking. You're free to go now. <laughs> that was going on. I know we have our physicist in the front here who probably thought, wait, I thought Nate was no, no. speaking. No, just so. All right, to start, I would like each of you to write down five virtues, and to be clear, a virtue is a behavior that is uh, of high moral quality. And I want you to write down five virtues that are important to you. And write those down, don't show them to your neighbors or anything, just put down five virtues that you think are really important to you. Behaviors, high moral quality behaviors. You can jot them on your phones if you can bring something to write with. We'll come back and revisit those virtues here in a moment. But a couple of questions as you are writing those down is, where do those virtues come from? Why are those virtues important to you? And are they connected in some way to your faith? What's the origin of those virtues? And is there a faith dimension to those virtues? And that's where this project really had its origin. It, I was involved in a study, a multinational study, a few years ago, and we published the study, and it was asking, are virtues national, supranational, or universal? And so that article came out, and I was having a conversation with the, the lead researcher on that article, and because we had found uh, uh, the influence of faith in those virtues that, that helped to explain some of the variability, but uh, he said, no, 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 you know, faith isn't really significant. And I mean, it was, it was there, but that's not the, the key. And, and so they dismiss it. In, uh, we dismissed it in that study. I mean, I was one of the contributing authors, but um, wasn't really on board. So then when I had the chance to contribute a chapter to this book, which was, will come out, I think it's coming out this April. It's going to be called Communication in the Global Landscape of Faith. And uh, I really wanted to reanalyze our data and look at the role of faith in the virtues and the differences between virtues that are prevalent in certain countries from certain national perspectives and from certain faith perspectives. And so when I had the chance to do that, uh, I got permission to reanalyze our data and I, that's what I'll be talking about today because um, my hunch was that faith had a lot to say about the, the contribution to differences in virtues between nations, between faith groups. And that not just to think about differences, but faith might have something to say about how we can use virtues to begin conversations across boundaries, that there's something organic about virtues. And that's one of the reasons that my colleagues and I looked at virtues to begin with, was values. When you think about values, values are fairly dis divisive. Uh, when we think about things that we value, uh, we can come up with, with things like, um, I value peace, uh, but 
do I have or reflect a life of tranquility? That's a virtue. If my life is is full of tranquility and I, and I reflect that, or um, I might value something like uh, happiness, but am I indeed happy? Do I do I possess that virtue? So whereas values tended to divide and distinguish, um, we thought that virtues were a little bit more organic and spoke to behavioral aspects, uh, reputations, if you will, that uh, we could then use those, things that we admire about people, we could use those as perhaps conversation starting points. So that's where this project had its genesis. Um, at the beginning of the chapter, I enter into a philosophical rationale for um, the, the role of, of language and faith and the ecology that faith creates in different communities. And I'm not going to bore you with that today. It's based on some Heideggerian thought, and that's where the word horizon comes from. Um, Heidegger, Martin Heidegger, German philosopher, used this idea of horizon as a, a barrier that was perceptible from certain vantage points. It was, a, it was a place that you could, a perspective that you could see, but as you shifted your vantage point, that horizon changes. So as you perceive any object, you perceive it from a certain vantage point, and, and the horizon, so my horizon on the edge of that couch and your horizon on that edge of that couch, what we see is based upon our vantage point. And as we shift our vantage points, that horizon changes. But at, at some point, our two perspectives converge, and we share a fusion of horizons. And so that's the idea that I kind of go into a little bit in the beginning of the chapter, is this idea of can virtues serve as that fusion point where we, where we have a horizon for understanding and seeing what each other sees. Okay? So that's, that's where I go into that a little bit. I'm not going to dwell on that today, but I do want to look at this idea of virtue and why virtues a little bit. So virtues um, have a couple of qualities that I think that make them interesting tools to bridge cultural divides. Um, the first is that they're connected to our life um, as, as faith-filled people, but also for people that don't claim a faith, for people who see themselves in a certain way as a whole person and what it means to be a whole person. Am I a person that is courageous? Am I a person that is loyal? Am I a person that is faithful? Um, even if it's not a religious-based faithfulness. Um, so they're connected to us, um, in a, in a, again, in an organic and a complete way that, that we see ourselves composed of these qualities. But it's not just an individual attribute. Um, communities rally around these concepts and these ideas. And so um, it's, uh, they, these, these ideas are traced way back to Aristotle, who talked about purpose and, and virtues of sorts that um, have benefit both for the individual, but also for the body, for the polity. And so that as we embrace these characteristics, that there's personal benefit, but there's also corporate benefit to these. So the virtue has utility in, in a lot of different respects, communally as well as personally. And so I think it then facilitates seeing a virtue, admiring a virtue, facilitates a bond between people as you both appreciate that virtue. And that's perhaps where the, the helpfulness comes in in bridging cultural divides. So if we can agree on the qualities of a well-lived life, then we have a starting point to, for a discussion. So um, other people have looked at virtues, a uh, number of people. Erickson looked at them in education. Dalsgaard and his group looked at them from a, a cultural standpoint. And they looked through written documents and pulled out what they considered universal virtues. Uh, hold these with a grain of salt. But, uh, so they looked through uh, particularly spiritual documents, uh, the Tanakh, the Bible, um, the Quran, and they pulled out virtues that they thought were the key or core virtues from these documents. And things that they came up with, six core virtues that were shared across these global faith groups were courage, justice, humanity, temperance, wisdom, and transcendence. Those were the overlapping virtues. Um, they admit in their study that uh, each of these, for instance, justice, 
has, is nuanced within each perspective and that they are applied differently in each uh, local setting. So that uh, what, what you think of as justice, you might agree on justice in this broad, general way, but the way it's uh, applied and thought of locally will be nuanced a little bit. So they do admit that. They do confess that there isn't and wasn't a one-to-one -one mapping um, across cultures of these virtues. So that was a, a problem. And they did say that each religion does have kind of its own virtue ethos. And so these ideas from Dalsgaard's study motiva motivated me to ask a couple of questions in, in, in my reanalysis of our data. So what did uh, the method consist of? Again, as Jay mentioned, 14 country study. Uh, we had over 2,900 subjects. Um, they were from 11 different language groups. There were four clusters of language groups, and I'll mention those later on when we look at some of the findings. 37.2% um, male, 62.8% female. And the questions that I was asking related to this conversation that I've been, the, kind of the preview I've been giving you is, um, do the most frequently nominated virtues across nations, um, do they vary by religion, by your affiliation and your religion? Um, second research question was, do virtues considered to be important vary by religious affiliation? So there were two parts to the data collection. One was a free response where we asked subjects to nominate virtues that they thought were important to them. And then the second set of, of the, the instrument was a set of virtues that had already been collected from a previous study. Um, they were considered to be uh, fairly universal or general, and we presented those to the subjects and they ranked them. And so there were two data sets, if you will, that were collected. And then the final question is, is there a geographic distribution? So is, is nationality, regionalism, is that part of the equation that you can uh, look at those regions and look at the virtues that dominate a particular region and then is there a correlation between the dominant religion or faith in that region so that we can say that there are certain virtue ethoses that, that uh, operate in each region of the world. So nationality and religion were two of the questions, but I think that what I was looking for is, is there a contribution of faith or religion to a particular national perspective? So. A um, couple of analyses that were done in, in this particular study. One is a correspondence analysis uh, to treat the categorical data when they were free response nominating the virtues. Um, I did a correspondence analysis that looked at the virtues and then faith or nationality and I'll present those to you in, in graphic form because it, it gives you a graphical representation of the correspondence between those, those variables. Um, the second set of data, because it uh, was quantitative, I could do an ANOVA, the analysis of variance, and then I did follow-up tests um, with the Bonferroni t-test as a post hoc. So for those of you who love statistics, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. So those of you who don't, we'll just keep going. So these are measurable. So virtues yes. are, yes. How would you uh, measure humanity? That seems kind of. They're, they're measurable in the sense of, well, when I ask you to rank order pre-existing virtues, then that rank ordering is, is a major, right? Um, and then th that's where the free response, I've asked you to name the virtues that are important to you. And then, yes, in order to show the categorical data, I had to assign numbers to those virtues. So uh, does that answer the question? So, Okay. Well, we're not measuring the extent or quantity of somebody's uh, wisdom or love or loyalty. We're just asking, is that something that you admire or want to reflect you, right? What would be so, a synonym for humanity? For humanity? Um, I don't know. Is that uh, does it can mean we... valuing different parts of the human race, or what does humanity mean? Can we hold on that? Can we come back to that? Um, because are you? I mean, yeah. Are, are we talking about humanity as the composition of peoples, 
or are we talking about humanitarianism, right? So let's hold on those questions, if you will, so we can get to the findings. Um, so a couple of things. This is the, these are the ethos, virtue ethos of the national data sets. So when we ask people, name virtues that are important to you, like I did when, I, when we started. I asked you to come up with five virtues that are important to you. Um, I took the top 10 that were present in the sets from each na nation, and that's what we have here. So I, wanna, I want you to look at these and look at, at how these might characterize an ethos of these nations. And when we get to the US uh, sample, I want you to look at yours, and, and then we'll hear, OK, what did you choose, and how is it similar or different from the US sample? Because part of my sample was drawn from uh, Bethel students and, and people in the Bethel community. And that was uh, in the initial data set. Um, my colleagues, they kind of complained. They said, well, a lot of your sample uh, reflects, you know, one, they self-identified as evangelical Christians, and two, it reflects certain kinds of, of virtues that weren't present in the broader U.S. sample because we collected some data from another institution in California. And uh, so I said, yeah, because they are faithful. And they had already dismissed faith as kind of a contributing factor to explaining differences. <laughs> so it, well, that was kind of interesting in and of itself. Um, one of the things that appeared in the data was a, um, a consistency amongst what I would call language clusters. So um, in Austria, the German sample, and then we also put the Dutch sample, which is further down, um, they had a lot of overlapping virtues. Uh, in fact, they shared eight of the top ten virtues were common. Um, if you see a couple of virtues as so, if, if helpfulness is seen as similar to um, kindness in one of the samples, if you see those two as related, then there's a lot of overlap between these, between these samples. Um, and you also, if you look at the the religious affiliations, and I pulled the religion data from a, a global survey of religion as well as the CIA, CIA World Factbook. Um, and so the Austria sample had 73.8 identified as Catholic, um, unaffiliated, which uh, we called them the nuns. Um, not a Catholic nun, but a N-O-N-E nun. And uh, so they were kind of thought of as as people who, who said faith is not important, but they unaffiliate from faith. And then 4.9% Protestant. So you do have, you know, 77% Christian, 78% Christian in the Austria sample. Germany, 34% Protestant, 34% Catholic, uh, 24, almost 25% unaffiliated. So high percentages of Christianity in both nations, plus a Germanic linguistic heritage. And so they had very similar, eight out of the 10 matching uh, top virtues for them. Um, if we flip down to the US and compare the, the United Kingdom with the US, again, eight out of 10 similar virtues. Um, and again, you have a shared uh, faith history uh, or, or commonality as well as a shared linguistic heritage. Uh, so. They shared eight out of 10 virtues. Um, you could argue nine if you start looking at the meanings of some of these different virtues. And Norway had a very similar virtue ethos to the English speaking uh, sample as well. Um, and you know, again, looking at the different virtues, if you, um, if you look at uh, helpfulness in a certain way, Norway, has eight out of the 10 that are the same as the, the US and UK sample. Um, so there, there seemed to be this pattern that was beginning to develop um, of not only linguistic heritage, but the faith, the dominant faith uh, or religion origin or populations within these nations that they tended to share common virtues. Um, and now was that uh, completely related to their, their linguistic heritage or was it completely related to the religious 
population. And that uh, would require a, another analysis and different instrument to tease out that difference, uh, whether it's just the language, language uh, heritage that's, that's accounting for these similarities. Um, another group, the Spanish language, uh, Mexico and the Spain sample um, had very uh, similar religious percentages. So 82% Catholic in Mexico, 78.6% Catholic in Spain, but very similar virtue ethos in both countries, um, dominated by respect uh, in both of those. Respect was the top virtue. Across the whole sample, some of the top virtues that showed up, honesty was the top virtue in five countries and the only virtue that showed up in every single sample from every single country, which is interesting. Um, respect was nominated in 11 countries and the top virtue in three countries. Again, uh, if you think of um, uh, a Latin uh, respeto culture, um, that tended to be the, the dominant factor in the Spanish language cultures. Kindness was nominated in 10 countries, openness in nine, eight, tolerance in eight, and so on, helpfulness and humor. So these were the top virtues. And if you think about starting points for bridging intercultural dialogue, uh, perhaps these virtues are, are beginning points. If we can agree on a couple of um, characteristics that we admire in people and that we want to foster, um, these might be good starting points. There were a couple of virtues that showed up that were one-offs. They were only nominated in one sample, in one country. Um, generosity showed up only in France. Uh, dynamism only in India. And solidarity only in Spain. So there were distinct virtues um, that, that tended to color the virtue composition or the ethos of that nation, um, but didn't have uh, you know, parallels in other countries. So let's look at the correspondences then between nationality and virtue. This is a look at the nationalities against virtue number one, which was honesty. Remember, honesty was nominated in every single <coughs> sample. So everybody said honesty is a, is a virtue and it's one of their top ten. Um, and you can see that the correspondence chart, they tend to converge toward the center. And in this analysis, um, if you have a variable that, that pulls away from the center on either dimension one, which is the nationality, or the virtue is dimension two here, um, if, if they're pulling away from the centroid, then that means that there's, there's a, it reflects or indicates some kind of a difference between those from the the dominant profile. Not that these two particular, like honesty and respect, aren't necessarily uh, you know, uh, really different in and of themselves, but they differ from the dominant profile of these two variables paired together. Um, so the nations tend to converge together toward the center on this. But if you break them out, break the nations out by dominant religion in this next chart, it's based on the dominant religion of a place and the virtues. Now you begin to see some of the differences, okay? suggesting that, um, that the nations may agree on honesty, but when you look at it as related to faith, now you're beginning to see some difference. So same virtue, but now looking at the, the way it's valued amongst the different faith traditions. And so put these two together, and you begin to see, so for instance, Czech Republic was the, uh, the country that had the largest population of unaffiliated, of nuns. Right? Um, law, I, the percentage was, was very high of people who said, I don't have faith, I don't have any faith. Um, and you can see the unaffiliated here next to resolution, Czech Republic here next to resolution. And so you, you can begin to see the nationalities reflected by their faith composition in uh, in the, in the representation of this data. There was a group here that had the, the five that said honesty was their number one. Austria, Germany, Malaysia, Hong Kong, the US is in there. Um, so they were over here closer to honesty. The respect, Mexico, Spain, Netherlands, all nominated respect as their top. So you can kind of see the, the correspondence between 
these uh, either faith or nationality and the different um, uh, virtues that, that they prize as their, their number one. Here's the second <coughs> virtue. This is the second leading virtue that was nominated by these um, faith groups. And again, you can see the, the correspondence between, so um, Muslim and Hindu tended to stay toward the centroid, which means they didn't really differ from the dominant profile, um, but some groups did. And for instance, the Catholic uh, perspective often was a little bit removed from the Protestant group. So while we think of ourselves as both coming from Christian traditions, the virtues reflected by those two faith groups tended to differ and, and cause, that differentiated these two populations. Um, the unaffiliated were always set off from most of the other faith traditions. Um, aside from there is a small Buddhist sample and they often were toward the center of the, the chart as well. So what does minus 10 mean on that scale? Just the, the movement away from the centroid of the graph. Um, it's not necessarily a fixed percentage, but um, I mean the chart is based on 10 units. And so, um, and they're either, yeah, so it's, uh, I don't know the specific math behind the, um, the equation behind the chart, but it's based upon Euclidean space. And so those are units uh, away. So I don't know what each unit stands for in terms of percentage though. So in terms of your, let me go back to the US chart. And I'm interested in the virtue that you chose. Um, we had our US down here. The virtues that you chose. This was the national sample for the US data. We have honesty, kindness, caring, respect, empathy, patient, openness, modesty, love. And there was a tie for the last position, humor and diligence. Um, what virtues did you, when I asked you to come up with some virtues, what did you choose? What were some of your virtues? Do you fit that profile? Or are they different? Justice. You had justice in yours? Mm -hmm. Okay. I have, uh, I have honesty. You had honesty in there? Philanthropy. Was honesty your top one? Yes. Okay. Philanthropy, okay. patience, love, and dialogue. Okay, um, so you fit that profile pretty well, actually. So justice was missing. Any others that you think were missing? Faith wasn't mentioned in very many of these self-nominated virtues. Um, but faith is usually, if you looked at the Dalsgaard data, faith is one of their top virtues. Erickson, faith is one of the top virtues. But missing from our multinational sample. Integrity. Integrity, okay. Honesty was one. Yeah. All right. Patience. Okay, you had patience in yours. You fit that profile. So others that are missing. Loyalty. Loyalty was also missing from this multinational sample. Loyalty, which is often one of the common virtues that's in the literature, uh, but absent when people were asked to freely nominate virtues. So one of the things that appeared in this data was um, some of the, the commonly respected virtues you know, that people like uh, William Bennett write about um, were missing from this multinational sample. Faith, loyalty, uh, those, those kinds of things. Isn't in the US. You're surprised that it's not? Yeah. Um, yeah, only in the French sample. Um, one of the other things that the French sample was was quite unique. So here's the French line. Um, generosity, courage, um, altruism was another one that the French nominated that no one else nominated. Uh, so smartness too. I, I question whether or not that's actually a virtue, uh, but maybe uh, somebody's life could be characterized by smartness. So. Um, real quick, so you can see that, uh, and this was the answer to my colleagues um, that said, you know, faith doesn't have anything to do with, with this data. When you run the ANOVAs on this data, um, and, and you see the, the distinction between these, um, the, the virtues based upon 
the, the groups, and this was, this was done looking at distinction of virtues and the, the between group difference was faith. Um, you see a significant difference in every single virtue. And these were on the ranking data. So when groups were presented with a list of virtues and said, put these in order, rank these, um, faith distinguished the rankings between every single virtue. Um, and now the effect sizes were small, granted, but the significance was there. Um, the most, the, the largest effect size was in fact on the virtue of faith. Um, and so the, to, to say that faith, um, that we are not distinguished in our faith, that we don't have a set of virtues that somehow identifies us, uh, I think is false. That our virtue set does distinguish us by faith group. And when you do the, the post hoc tests, uh, comparing faith group to faith group, again, each one of them different, and I just chose uh, faith because it had the largest effect size. Um, and when you look at even the difference between um, Catholics and Lutherans or, or uh, Baptists and, and Catholics, you still have a significant difference in their characterization or valuing, ranking of, of these virtues. Um, so what is, where does that take us and, and what does it mean? I think one, distinct religions do have distinct profiles, virtue profiles. And it's interesting because I think you can look at uh, each culture. So the French culture, highly Catholic culture from a heritage standpoint, but some really interesting virtues. Let's tell me to stop. Really interesting, unique virtues that nuance that Catholic culture that differentiate them from an Austrian culture uh, that is also highly Catholic. And so each culture has its unique virtue profile that I think gives us insight into that culture. Um, so the, the, the respeto culture of Spain that has a Catholic culture versus, versus the uh, generosity, helpfulness, um, honesty culture of France, both Catholic cultures, but the virtues that they endorse help us to maybe understand them a little bit uniquely. Um, so. They, the virtues help us, give us a window in to the culture, but they also, um, I think, give us that discussion starting point, and that's the horizon. So if I see that the, the French value generosity, but uh, the, in the U.S. we value um, helpfulness, um, well, maybe there's a, a bridge there that we can put together and begin a conversation um, between uh, the Muslim cultures, for instance. Let's go back and... Uh, look at the <clears throat> oh. um, if we can find a discussion starting point in the virtues between the Muslim cultures then that might be a, a, an origin for an interfaith conversation. So let's go to Malaysia, where we have honesty as the top value in Malaysia. We know that honesty was also the top value in the US. Um, you have a point for a conversation. Um, love, kindness, helpfulness, um, these are our top virtues then they might be discussion starting points for a conversation that sets aside some of the, the faith differences or, or even values differences that might keep us apart, keep us out of conversation. So those are, are some of the findings and the, I guess the direction that I'm suggesting in this chapter is that we use these virtues as maybe concepts with less baggage that allow us insight into a culture, but also that, that discussion starting point. So, your thoughts and questions? So, is this sample a national sample, or is it from institutions from each country? If so, does it reflect religious composition and language composition of the data? Or? The, I mean, they were from various institutions within, <coughs> so most of them were from 
um, educational institutions within those countries. So that's going to give you a particular kind of, of sample for sure. That will not reflect the U.S. but just composition will be different. So, but that can found the answer somewhere. Yeah, the uh, it's going to it's going to I mean to the extent that the universities one of the universities in the U.S. was a public university. Um, and so the, my sample, that's why we actually added data to the U.S. sample, was to get a more reflective sample um, because a lot of my data came from Bethel and, and there was a lot of homogeneity within that data. Um, so, but for most of the other samples, they came from public universities. So to that extent, they reflected um, at least the educated uh, public, uh, a broad range within those countries. So. Could yeah. religion be different than the religious institutions? They could be homogenous against like that. Yes, yeah. But most of the other institutions, in fact, none of the other, other institutions were religious institutions for colleges. And of course, that's the criticism on a lot of data that uses college samples, right? Um, so is, do they reflect the national sample? Yeah. Other thoughts or questions? Thoughts on virtues as a starting point for a conversation? I'm curious, you mentioned that um, the virtues that came up in your study were different than like Erickson and some of the other maybe older uh, mm -hmm. lists. What, yep. do you, what do you attribute that difference to? Um, I think in, in a lot of these samples, you'll notice the, the unaffiliated percentages are quite high. Even in the US, um, the unaffiliated percentage is 16.4. In the UK, 25%. So I think part of it is that changing composition, the changing faith composition in the sample. I think part of it might reflect that. Um, the, the Erickson data, I think, was collected in the 60s, 70s. Um, so, and Dalsgaard was pulling from you know ancient manuscripts that may or may not reflect contemporary. So I think the, the virtues, especially this sample that we got, um, reflect more contemporary perspectives. Uh, so, and some virtues that we didn't really think of virtues. For instance, in the Spanish sample, solidarity, um, you know, that might reflect more contemporary economic and political you know, circumstances. So, uh, yeah. Just curious your opinion on something. Do you, do you think what's represented here is what folks from these countries would really like to be versus, um, you know, a, a real definition of kind of the values currently represented, you know, within those cultures. For example, I'll take Norway, for example. I've lived in Norway. Openness is number one. Honestly, I don't necessarily see that practiced, but I'm sure Norwegians would like to be open. So I about, guess the... How about humor? We know they have no humor. <laughs> So, so I'm just curious your take on that. You know, are these the aspirations you think of these folks, or do you think this is representative of the culture? The way they were phrased in the instrument, uh, they were designed to reflect um, life principles that were important to them. So the idea was, you are living this way. These are behavioral characteristics, not aspirational. Um, now, it's a self-report. Right. Right. So. Uh, they, they may or may not reflect, you know, uh, the, the image may or may not reflect the actual product, right? <laughs> like any advertising. So, yeah. Were the questions all in English in every case? No, no. They were translated into each language. Yeah. All the instruments were translated into the native. It would be quite interesting, I think, uh, different use of the data to create a thesaurus. <clears throat> for the terms that you have here, because I see a lot of terms that you have sort of a, you have a consonance in the terms. For instance, uh, helpfulness and uh, what I put down, philanthropy. I, I think it would be quite interesting to create and just, just out of the data, uh, an English thesaurus to see what kinds of groupings you came up with. Right, and so there's where some of the additional overlap comes in these concepts is um, what one culture might term kindness and yes. perceive as kindness is that helpfulness in another yes. context. So, yeah. Um, and these were distinctions that the 
the team had to make as, as we were looking at differences. Um, and in the uh, original data set, um, they, uh, there were a lot more virtues obviously nominated that you know, were collapsed into certain categories. Well, thank you. So, oh, one more question. Um, were subjects able to sort of self-identify their yeah. national culture as well? So that, like, in immigration situations where mm -hmm. someone's actual family of origin culture may differ from the culture they currently yep. live in, yep. that was all accounted for? It was. So okay. they often, for instance, expats would identify their national heritage, and but they were living in France or Norway. Or, um, but so, and then they were... Um, those were their special cases, and in some cases they were left in the data, depended on the, the year, the length of, of residence, um, but newer expats would be put into the other sample because they reflected a different value set or virtue set. Thanks for coming out, and uh, again, this book, uh, The Communication in the Global Landscape of Faith, should be coming out in April. I think it's in press right now. And uh, you're welcome to, maybe the library will get a copy if you want to actually read the chapter. Take a peek at that. Thanks a lot.